There it is. Go. Well, let me repeat myself. Hello and welcome everyone to this this evening of uh, Angora Poets Paris, the World Cafe, or this afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, we welcome you to listen in to what we uh, predict is going to be a memorable evening of poets of different styles, uh, different cities and places. So welcome aboard and um, we're glad to have you with us. And so with that, I would like to present our first poet, who we affectionately call the judge, and uh, that would be Bill Strangmeyer. Hello, Bill, you are on. Hello, Mo. Um, this, uh, this is to Isaac Dennison, with a quote from her. If a fox were not so, a beautiful and perfect thing, God would not be beautiful and perfect either, from a story called Peter and Rosa, hmm. to Isaac Dennison. The beauty of a fairy tale was a gift she gave the world, but only meant for those who see the tragic beauty in this life, who seek to see the glory in a foolish whim, who feel that life is gift enough and count the secrets in a glance. What matters death in youth if you contain a riddle made for God? The glamour in luxuriant mind can bless the meanest circumstance that earth can conjure up and magic is a part of every day. If other churches than her tales were kind in cruelty like her, if they could understand the human curse, the passion for a childish goal, perhaps they wouldn't now be dying, turned to murder fueled by lack of faith or filled with cold and spiteful power plans. Her love of beauty, her design, to distill it from a baser ore, to see transcended pain and loss transformed in explanation of the soul. We all have reasons, need forgiveness, Wish the world could know our hearts. She saw as if through glass the inner life of humans when they are alone or when in love or buoyed by love to bear us up to see as if like her. Will I then learn to see like her? All right. Good way to break the ice there, Billy. Thank you. Very nice. And right. Um, it said that we are all created in the image of God. I don't look like you. Da 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 da. <laughs> so, uh, can we hear a second one, please? Sure. Um, <clears throat> a name that's come up uh, earlier this evening. Carl Sagan said a book is made from a tree. This is called Bird's Nest: A Conceit. I've climbed to near the top of it, branch by branch. Some broke beneath my hands and feet, and others were too wrong and weak. From roots to berries, nuts and fruit and leaves, strange tree. I've counted every gnarl and track and bird hole, every bird and porcupine. With some regret, I note the twigs I've broken off and also see old paths, a route that led more easily to here and better views I might have seen. And yet I'm here and have not failed to mark a way and leave a mark. The broken twigs and various falls have calmed the muddy rage to climb. When this tree was a sapling, it promised more, I'm told, and I believe. It was to be a mighty thing. It was to be so green and shady and itself a whole. There was a tree house built upon a time that rose up with the growing tree. I lived in it or visited, slept over, had club meetings, tea parties, loves. But now climb over, past its roof, and have less need of shelter there. I can see so far from here. It seems I can see all the world. The forest is broad and thick, the shadowed underbrush thinning out. The tree does not seem to be slowing its growth and the higher view will be pleasant, I think. But some leaves and branches have faded, crumbled and fallen below. There may be rain or snow, though the weather has always been easy here but I think I will never climb down to the treehouse to stay there again. No matter the weather, to feel kin to the eagles is more of a thrill than a curse, an answer to prayers or a jape, whatever the tales we live out in our dreams. Wow. The, the wisdom, sweet and sour, of the passing of time. All right, Bill. Can you uh, give us uh, Three's a Charm, uh, as we call the third poem? Yes, uh, this is called transactional. Social animals <clears throat> given to belonging, whatever fad they give you is enough. 
a little bit of difference, a little bit of laughter, belongings, not for you. I mean, you cannot have it. That feeling's all you get, all you deserve. So easy to transform the worldwide herd. If you, <clears throat> if you have the time, just a couple generations and they're traitors. Too dumb to see it coming. Don't even see the titles. It's written into jokes and in the movies. And because the villain always loses there, they th they'll think it never comes to pass. But it's coming on to stay, think not? The team spirit always gets them. And the fall guy's always pulling in the fists and the thrown rocks. This year, the old hetero white male. There you go, age, orientation, race, sex, the bigots home run. Always a one. Well, they play their game. They'll bring back black folk, gays, and Jews. But it's only fair for all to hate the each. And pleasure, too, must now be hated. Sex is off the books of righteous prophets, standard mammalian sex, at least. But it's only fair, right? Payback's a bitch, but who gets the bill? Not the bosses, the nobles, the kings, the rich. Not the mandarins or brahmins pissing down. Who wrote the law books? For y'all good folk to follow. And who killed dissent? Everybody loves a pylon just to show them. How can you stop the rain from falling down on them? Because they're different, the bastards, the different. Different from what? From us, we hope. I despair of mankind. Oh, sorry, wrong term. Like every evil down through time, it's just damn silly as a cause. What? Well, whatever hatred you espouse, whatever innocence you would despoil, deny. The tortured twisters of the language rule. The Romans thought bad Latin showed deceit. We are not astute like that because we love crooks, because we have fake heroes, because we're team players, company men, or women, solidarity. Maggie Thatcher, Sarah Palin, Hillary Clinton, Kamala Harris. Not hard to find men they're better than or worse, but who cares? Politics always attracts the vilest from Caesar till today. And the sheep follow along. Give them a bright, shiny light. Give them a gas bag or a silly cause. They'll go for it as long as there's rage or even a way to put down their friends, a way to turn jealousy into an enmity, a way to beat losers. You're a loser if you bite. The humans love their spite. The imp called spite lives in our souls. To follow its voice is to court cowardice. Speak kind and honest if you would be a warrior. All but the psychopaths have a conscience and conscience doth family too. That's how they'll hold you. They are brutes and their supporters are clueless brutes and mob cowards. They come in all colors and sexes. The proof that there is no God is this. There are a million in every country. What an odious invention, countries. Less in the small ones, more in the big. Who should not live? Who should die? Who are they? The psychopaths, most politicians, talentless billionaires, street gangs, many cops, serial criminals, Mafias, hackers, bullies, street thieves, pricks, bitches, snots, no wait. I'm getting too personal now. But really, aren't there many who should not be alive? Just life, I guess. Thank you. Okay. That's why we call him the judge. <laughs> okay. All right, Bill. Well, you laid out a plethora of topics there. Okay, thank you, Bill Strangmeyer. And uh, now I'd like to move on to uh, uh, Harvey Suss. Suss? Suss. I, Suss, I'm sorry. Suss. Harvey Suss. Uh, join yeah, us. Uh, rather than reading three poems, I'd like to read one that's longer, but not a memoir, not the, 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 the sort we were talking about before, uh, just to have the opportunity to do it. Uh, and I would also, again, like to invite you all to uh, Artful Dodgers Poetry's uh, open mic plus features. Uh, I have the, um, the invitation posted in the chat. Uh, and I see that, Jack, you have a Brooklyn uh, sweatshirt on there. Uh, are you from Brooklyn? Oh, I, I, you're, you're muted. So, well, uh, anyway, let me bring up the poem. I do have a Brooklyn sweatshirt on. I did live in Brooklyn. Oh, on okay. two, two different occasions. Uh, well, that's where I'm. What well, that's where I'm broadcasting from at the moment. Uh, okay, and I might add that people could note how you spell your name and contact you. Uh, what? what uh, yes, I, I'm. Um, I've actually heard about that that reading through Gordon. Oh right, sure. Yeah. 
who's uh, an old friend. I mean, I, I lived in New York for many years. Well, all right. Let, let's hear Let's hear uh, your poetry, Harvey. Okay. Uh, just one brief note of explanation. Uh, it, it's titled and refers to the Happy Land Social Club fire, uh, which until relatively recently uh, was the greatest loss of life since the, uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist fire in uh, 1919 in the city of New York, uh, where it references Garifunas. Garifunas are a group of people who are a, com a combination of indigenous uh, Indian, uh, Hispanic and black, who uh, I believe uh, came from Honduras to, um, um, well, to Honduras from, from one of the islands uh, and who populate a section of the Bronx in New York. This is called Happy Land Social Club Fire. The arsonist, before being jerked upright and cuffed to a bedpost, left a trail of gasoline-soaked clothes leading to his bed. The room stank of petroleum product, discovered still asleep, crooked jaw propped on a pillow, seemingly undisturbed by the chirpings of ambulances backing up to body bags. This self-appointed sous chef of the devil appeared relaxed. Devil may care. After a night spent preparing a killer repast, deserving in prison cafeteria terms of a Michelin star, albeit it may be having overcooked his meats a little, intending a steak tatar. The number of casualties won every subsequent mass murderer, whether pistolero, poisoner, or arsonist, would be judged against. Dead to the world he slept on in only his underwear yellowed by piss and accelerant pants, shirt and pork pie hat on the floor, perhaps as a Marialito dreaming of a roast pork bay of pigs, this little piggy going to market, that little piggy in a dress, his targeted ex going up in flames. Only they weren't piggies, were they, that were burning, but mostly Hondurans, immigrants like himself, gathered in 1990 on the Happy Land dance floor for Carnival a celebration that ended in conflagration, leaving five or possibly six survivors, 87 dead. His ex, ducking the one-two punch of asphyxiation and trampling among those fortunate few who survived, all other celebrants blistered and dripping out of fancy dress like cheese melts. Not since Manhattan's Triangle Shirtwaist factory designated a National Historic Landmark for all the wrong reasons, 146 of them spat out its workforce hot as Tabasco sauce. Coincidentally, on the same day, March 25th, 1911, had so much buzzard-ready fast food lit up the night sky on the fire next time hallucinating streets of Nueva York, near 100 fine as Garafuna and their Romeos appearing to return to dust before our eyes, practically fizzing into now you see us, now you don't incorporeality under heavy pressure from hydrant hoses. Like so many wicked witches or Alka-Seltzer tablets melting in a water glass, importing the sort of Aussie and unreality one can't simply wish or wash away Beware the Ides of March, a must if you're a Caesar. If you're a New Yorker working or playing in a fire trap, beware March 25th, more than a bad hair day, that one. To be historically accurate, April is not always the cruelest month, not in 1911, not in 1990. The seed of such cruelty visited upon the living whose obligation it became in those first days of April to identify blue black faces of the asphyxiated, what little was left of the coquette in the briquette was planted in March by Julio Gonzalez, Cuban expat, rejected ex of Lydia Feliciano, coat check girl at Happy Land, whose fandango eyes no longer sparked when they met his. Accelerant enough for his matchbook longings, his fired up imaginings. 
unemployed, apparently he could find nothing better to do with his woke time than kill or try to. The woman who told him she was through. If he couldn't rekindle her love, well, then she deserved it. As for collateral damage, you have to break a few eggs. It took two matches, socializing with splashes of gas to block the lone exit. Imagine this, what fire refused to take those five or six known to have survived Lydia and several other Afro-Amerindian revelers along with a handful of black Caribs who lay dying but not yet dead, was packed off on stiff gurneys, row upon row upon row of them for triaging or subterranean morgue disposal as each case warranted, clackety clacking as they rolled down the pea green antediluvian halls of the burn unit at Bellevue, a magnet hospital in search of polarity and a fresh paint job. Renowned in ambulance chasing circles for drawing worst case scenarios, screaming war wagons into its narrow drive, its staff members, war zone tough, thinking they'd seen and done it all, finally forced by the carnage before them to concede a murder of crowing actuaries shown to be statistically fugazi had got it wrong. These young partiers, an unheard of 95% of them, would not outlive the jukebox song. Next day, Monday, March 26, late waking gawkers having slept through five alarms, buzzed like the fly, half insect, half human, against crime scene tape, tape marking the site, 1959 Southern Boulevard in the West Farm section of the Bronx as a place of special interest, one on which further reportage might shed some light. Breaking news declaring the jukebox at Happy Land to have spread such liveliness that on bridge and tunnel nights its amped up thumping would boom across the throbs neck bridge into the dead to the world bedrooms of Astoria, Queens, lacking only that one Corinthians 15 last call urgency of Miles Davis's trumpet to wake the dead. The 25th with a xylophone lineup of body bags, having been a dark vomit inducing night, even the pole star having a bout face to spew. With frustrated rescue dogs snuffling corpses for any signs of life and finding none. All those pretty chicks at one fell swoop bit players in Julio's revenge drama as bloods and crips watched in clusters of nervous ganglions, trading gang signs, registering on FD scanners, thermally imaged bravado, somber groups of our bravest done with all that, cleaned up after double shifts, halfway into a third, wrangling ladders back onto their trucks, coiling limp hoses, pausing to wash their hands clear of burnt flesh at an opened hydrant, which marked fair distance for a street ball home run. The scoreboard for those who were counting stood at 87 to six, more suggestive of cricket than stateside baseball. Overmatched first responders, dogs and men on the short end of the score. One crew chief thought by many to be dressed as a yellow jacket, the kind that might chase you from first to second base in yellow slicker accessorized by hard hat of yellow plastic, decided to teach heckling POCs a bit of ESL crude English as a second language. All the curse words any effluent offshoot of thuggery could hope for. And teach them he did. Unfulfillment trailing behind him like a piece of toilet paper stuck to a shoe. Ordering them big man looking bigger that day for sturdy hat and boots, ax in hand, sporting a yellow jacket attitude to stay the F out of his effing way, effing this, effing that. 159th Street between East Tremont Avenue and East 178th Street having been sealed off by effing sawhorses where only scant hours before the happiest of happy landers, with rare exception had sizzled in their own body fat. Thank you. 
Well, that's a vivid account. Wow. And you know, in much smaller numbers, one by one, um, since this pandemic has started, the rise of, of violence and fatal violence, conjugal violence, um, husbands against wives and children has mm -hmm. radically increased. So um, you know, the criminal in your case was a man who, uh, who acted out on un unrequited love. And, and, um, he did do that. One exit, and that's the exit that he set on fire. Right. And it just reminds me also that um, those numbers are, have, uh, according to reports, have skyrocketed since the pandemic, which is to say it's almost exclusively as reported that it's men uh, acting out uh, on their wives and children, uh, you know, uh, injuring and, uh, and worse. Well, okay. Well, thank you, Harvey. And uh, we'll come back in the uh, second round and read again for us. I'll try and think of something with a slightly happier theme. <laughs> hey, well, it's your call, actually. It's your call. They land as they land. All right. Fair enough. Thank so you, by the way, Mo, for letting me do that, because frankly, other than I'm reluctant to even give myself that time at my own reading. So, you know, thanks. Well, yeah, well, I'd like to mention it's not so difficult because here at Angora Poets, uh, we value a small number so that we can listen and react and talk to our poets rather than put them on meet the clock. Okay. So good enough. There's, there's a place for all those formats and ours happens to be this way. So thank you. And next I'd like to move over to another first timer with us, a very interesting young person who's getting his degree in poetry and anarchist poetry. Uh, Marion, how are you? I'd like to invite you on. Hello. Thank you very much. I am, I am well. Um, I'm going to be reading some poems that have been involved with the Chicago anarchist scene and organizing uh, in, 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 uh, for, for, for the past few months since May, in fact. And most of the poems that I'm, uh, two, two thirds of the poems that I'm going to read here are directly tied to those experiences engaging with direct action and protests and uh, other other, other events in, in attempting to create, sustain, and support community. Um, the first poem I'll be reading is called Merger's Chorus. Hold up, holding out, holding on. Retool to mask a mind to ream the streets. Do you know that we're all marching and not a single one of us know if we're as strong as all that assails? Those tides of blue which curl and choke, spilling open in our sleep, guts and pomegranates, bullets cascading out of glazed intestines. They tell us their seeds to sow their justice, hold up, holding out, holding on. Fattened and steaming, this is all pork serves, misinformation yielding and doughy. Tuck in, fill your mouth so you cannot scream. Tongues glued to teeth and the whole skeleton comes down, rickety ashamed of its own ability to fight back. How far do we go? Farther. How fast do we go? Faster, hold up, holding out, holding on. If all I can do in this lifetime is right, let it be with words that make us walk. Hold up, holding out, holding on. Oh, thank you, thank you. May I ask, is that movement that you're talking about is it current, is, is it that activity related to uh, Black Lives Matter or Antifa? Yeah, it's, it's related to Black Lives Matter. That, that's been the focus of our protests, though there, there's also any, any liberation movement has to be intersectional. Um, and so we've also been engaging with the native community of Chicago. There's this really brilliant organization called uh, Chi Town Youth Council um, that's uh, primarily, that, that, that's uh, dedicated towards native grassroots activism. And so there was a very large rally around the Columbus statue that was previously in, in a pretty large park in Chicago that we were attempting to, to, to get down, which is native centered activism. Um, Okay, well, thank you. And let's hear another one, please, Marion. This, this is, in fact, related to that Columbus statue. Columbus takes a swim. Every stone I know is trembling in its skin now that it sees the young are here to shuck off all the terrors we've grown with, waxing, built, and red. 
We will no longer sing statues to slumber each night, knowing as we do the dusk of all the unmarked souls it took to mint them. There's no longer excuse to bear less than full the measure of what our rock has done, how we've let it into our skulls, bid it girdle the small bones in our hands so we can pour tea, stronger, crueler. We fashioned lullabies of what we've stolen and then laid the carven faces of our lords to gentle rest beneath tucked sheets, while we ourselves all backs to beating beaten bodies lowered into arms. How much did we really need to know our own name by carving it again and again into the back of a receded nation? We cannot sing ourselves easily to sleep, so pry the stone out of your fucking skeleton and use it to mark some forgotten graves so there won't be any more. Yeah. yeah. It's nice. Uh, pry the stone from your fucking skeleton and place it on an unmarked grave. That's a keeper, Marion. That is really a frigging wonderful keeper. Thank you. Okay. Would you uh, would you give us what we call threes a charm? Yes. If if I may, before I read the third poem, um, I have a chat book that came out in April, and I have another oh. one that's that's going to be published in spring. So I'm I'm after I read, I'm just going to drop the my website in the chat for anybody who's interested in seeing some other things that I've written or or maybe engaging with with this uh textual artifact of a, a, a physical aspect of publication. Um, well, for those who uh, who might only see this in a recording, what are the names of your chat books? And uh, where can they be gotten? Yes, so the names of my chat books are Cool Talks Dead I Guess from Bone and Ink Press, which is this really cool punk publisher. And then the Messiah's Custom, that, that one was published in April of this year. The Messiah's Customary Diner Booth is forthcoming from Unsolicited Press in February 2021, and it's available for pre-order right now. Uh, you can find that and another disappearing chat book that's been published on Really Serious Literature's Instagram, as well as uh, other uh, literary magazines and publications on my website, mariandeal.com. Um, or, or you Mary can go okay, people, MarianDeal.com. Very good, very good. Sell a million. Any poet, sell a million. In this, in this case, yourself. Okay. Fingers so, right. Oh, and uh, what did you go to? Unsolicited press. Yes. Uh, once in front of Shakespeare for one season at Shakespeare and Company, Paris. I went against the grain of, of the uh, entitled poets. And, and and had a very successful series called the unauthorized poets so there we go okay so please uh give us your threes a charm dead names and then the uh, subtitle or epigraph the human toll of the virus uh the, there was an article published in the new york times on may 24th that had every name of the person or, or who died or had many names of the people who died of coronavirus just page after page after page and uh the online version had various biographies or quotations from people who knew them part one plague there's little I haven't promised to a name on a page when all costs are alkaline and unbearable, and the only purpose my skin serves is a palimpsest to be inked by the dead. Dead names, dead names, deadened names writhing in the great frail trunk of chafing paper. Fat section letters with five or more hearts pumping names squealing out of the rain-choked soil like plague worms. Moses didn't have a name in the end because every time he visited a plague upon a people, he divested himself of a bit of it, sharing letters into a harness team of maggots that pulls a crinkled chariot across the soil and the sun, full of all the names that have ever died hyped on hormones and the astroturf that cloaks each new grave. Part two, queer. Someone wanted me to braid the grave worms into the fleshy axons that roost beneath my skull, but I've been too far gone on the rod of newsprint and testosterone patches to ask them why, and they're dead anyway. Well, they know that my body will change until it meets the grave, and all that's left will be the names that creep below the skin. Thank you so much for letting me read. This was... Uh, a, a pleasure and a privilege. Well, well, it's our pleasure, and it's your right. So thank you. Thank you for coming on board. And um, uh, I wanted to mention this, uh, is that the mainstream media and a lot of reactionary people along with it are declaring Antifa is this 
uh, is this nationally well-organized conspiracy to bring down the country. And it's not that, uh, you know, it is, it, is. it is what it is, but it's not what the media has been claiming that it is. And um, I find it rather interesting that, it, that so many people condemn a group that's named after anti-fascist. You know, when uh, 60 years ago, uh, that title, the name of that kind of group would have been applauded. So that, not that they haven't made some mistakes, in my opinion, you know, not that they haven't made some mistakes. But I just, the one person that doesn't fall for that bit that they've hyped Antifa is this potential threat to national stability. And that's just not the case by intention or by numbers. Okay. End of that statement. Okay, Doc Janning, I think you were up next, Mr. Doc. I believe so. Okay, come on board, sir. I'll begin with uh, a poem which I'm working on for a solstice ceremony for tomorrow. And it's titled Solstice. The dawn of a new pathway a meandered intuition and coveted divination of time draws from the edge of darkness and evidence of the past, a universe, a universe beyond imagination to reveal nexes of dimensions within dimensions, the void in the space between, the dawn of dreams of unknown futures, illuminates echoes of the heart in the bright warmth and rememory of love renewed till the forever beyond forever by the sky-clad sunrise magic of tomorrow. That's one. There we go. Mm, there we go. That, that's nice. That's very nice. And very true, it is the solstice coming up tomorrow. So, would you give Number us a second two. one? Number two. Mystic moonlit mangata. Winds of time dance through secret gardens of the mind. Evoke sacred scents of sheltered memories from nightbound infinities of before today beyond tomorrow, to bloom and bell in dreams of the real, the imagined, the possible, the improbable, on mystic moonlit mangata, voyages on seas of love. Okay. Poets and astrophysicists, uh, unite, unite. <laughs> All right, Doc, how about Three's a Charm, friend? Okay. This one is Chimera. And it begins what, with... What would that... I'm sorry, Doc. What would that mean, the title word? Uh, a Chimera is really something inexplicable. Uh, it is... It is sometimes referred to as a, a hybrid beast and other times as, uh, I can't remember the exact definition. Uh, hold on a second, I'll give it to you. It's an elusive beast. <sighs> I believe on. it's referred to in, in Greek mythology. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, so just come on board okay. with that poem. Uh, we're, yeah, okay, we're in Greek mythology, it's a fire breathing female monster with a lion's head, a goat's body, and a serpent's tail. Uh, it can be any mythical animal with parts taken from various animals. Uh, or another one. The second, hey. the second uh, definition is a thing that is hoped or wished for, but in fact is illusory or impossible to achieve. And that, I think, is going to be more the idea of this poem. It begins with a quote from Shakespeare's play, Hamlet. To sleep, 
to sleep perchance to dream, crossing the divide of self the body cannot, amidst all the whispered soundscapes of life. Dreaming, we rewrite the intangible stars, paint them in all the flavors of our longing and all the colors of Saudade and Herith, creating visions of an unremembered future from shards and detritus of the past, we design our universe, a new chimera. Gathering those myriad fragments, we shape and create a longed for whole into the waking dawn of a new world. Thank you. Let's have an awakening dawn of a new world, please. Up for that. Okay, Doc. Can we have three's a charm, please? I that was my third third one. Oh well then, listen to me. <laughs> I was I was caught up with the poem. And I would like to hey Benedicta. Hello. I'd like to call you up Hi. next. Hi. Would like to say thank you, Doc, and call up Benedicta in that order. Thank Hi. you, Doc. Hello, Benedicta. Hi. Hi. Is my sound clear? Yes, it is. Okay. So the first one will be a haiku by me. And it says, undated and creeping, plausible, intense, a gap of wholeness in a catch. That's the first one. Okay, and as is customary with haikus and manokos, we ask you to read it again, please. Undated and creeping, plausible, intense, a gap of wholeness in a catch. Okay. That's the first one. Thank you. Then the second one, I posted it on my blog. I still can share as usual. Mm -hmm. That one is a monoku as well. And I read, unadorned phrases of an unbidden past. I read a second time. Please do. Un unadorned phrases of an unbidden past. And I took this from It Comes On A Dawn by Toni Morrison. Okay, great. Okay. So I wanted to share what she stated when it came to On A Dawn from her own poem. I wanted to read it out so that we get to know the concept about what she stated. All right. It comes on a dawn like a phrase strong enough to cast a spell. It comes unbidden, like the turn of sun through hills or stars infused of a song. The jeweled feet of women dance the earth, arousing it to spring. Shoulders broad as a root bent to share the weight of years. Profiles breach the distance and mean toward an ordinary kiss, bliss. It comes naked into the world like a charm. And she published this in 2019. All right. I hope it was clear. Yes, it was. And, and I hope it uh, alerts people that the great novelist and public speaker who I've heard, Toni Morrison, and Nobel Prize winner, who we should note, um, um, has also written poetry. So there we go. Okay, well, thank you, Benedicta. That was very nice of you. Thank you very much. All right, yeah, and welcome. now, okay. And so uh, now what we should do is, wait a minute, let me get these. Okay, there we go. Uh, so now we will go to Jack and then Dave and then Mo. How's that sound? So let's, um, Let's introduce now uh, Jack Cooper. Hello, Jack. Glad you're back. Hello, everyone. Um, I agree. 
I'll do it. Uh, my, my first piece is, is called uh, Solstice as it happens. Fumbling blind, importunate discovery, impetuously uncovered. What precisely can we but trust, not wholly misapprehend, only strive obscurely, suspicious of expect? That uncertainty arrived at last in total darkness. Come home, fellow shining, silver, wet, visible through rain. There you go. Yes, nature and the beauty thereof will not be denied. Well done, Jack. Such is affirmed on that poem. Thank you, Benedicta. Okay, so let us hear another one from you, Jack. Okay. And no, I'm, I got the volume on. I have to turn off my chicken, but I got the volume on. All right. <clears throat> buck, buck. Or cluck, cluck. Uh, th this is called Sup. Sup. I supped on memory tonight, and sorted chronology, glimpsed being, cursed to become. Still stranger to myself, disdained intruder, adversary most and least advocate, despite scape goated name. The fame once sought has quite turned me on its head. Misprision mine, my effort to esteem myself both father and the child. Discredited since I live and work a man alone, no one yet to care for me, except less, and then pity him. All I should have done, not did, who I was and am never to have been. Very nice, very nice. Oh, that's good. Very I good. like the part of disdained in truth and never to have been. Yeah. Yes, that was, that was written at a um, rather low moment. <laughs> what? Poets have low moments? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's not bad. It's good. Well, as it happens, I read about it in a book. The low moment. <clears throat> And then this was, um, you know, from a, actually pretty much the same time. Um, since we're in the Christmas season, I thought I would read this and uh, dedicate it to Bill Strangmeyer. Oh, wow. It's called Humbug. I put up some lights tonight, which trace tracks inside my tears, coruscate the mistletoe without lips to read, what good will it do? What strange and spiteful world surrounds, links disregard to discard, like popcorn strung around the tree. Me deplores, ha, ha, ha. 
with neither toys nor joy to lead its sleigh. What can Christmas be or become but carols mouthed by exiles, bystanders at the feast who know not that they do? The Christ they slew, newborn this day, Santa they forgot, alike receive lip service, well deserved, as deceived, ho, ho, ho. Yo, yo, yo. Ho, ho, ho. What do you want, what do you want for Christmas, Jack? Oh, anything you like, Will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, jealous. Uh, okay. Thank yeah, you, Jack. I, I mean, I, I should say, you know, apologize, because actually I'm having a great uh, lead up to the, to the holiday. So good. <laughs> good to hear that. <laughs> good to hear that. All right. Thank you, Jack. And I see your Christmas tree. Yeah. Find you with the lights there. Okay. All right. I didn't buy everything from the Old and the New Testament, but I love trees with colored lights. <laughs> yeah. There you go. All right. Deck the halls, y'all. Okay. Speaking of uh, Christmas spirit, our next poet is wearing a Santa hat. Hello, David Wilson. Ho, ho, fucking ho. Hey, here we are. <laughs> And um, I want to say uh, uh, greetings, Harvey and Marion. Nice to have you joining us. Uh, I'll start off with a cover poem uh, from Ezra Pound. In a station of the metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. <clears throat> I love that poem. It's one of my favorites of all time. It's one of mine. If, uh, if, you, if, if you don't mind, since, since that was so brief, would you, yeah. re would you repeat that, please? Yes, and I, I'm actually reciting it from memory. I know that one so well. Okay. Um, in a station of the Metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. That's one of the things I love about Pound is how he, um, you know, he wrote huge, immense, long poems, the yeah. cantos. And he also, you know, did his images stuff like that. It's just very precise. Well, thank you, because uh, I have never listened to or read a brief Ezra Pound poem. <laughs> I mean, referring to the cantos, you know what I mean? Okay. He's all one right. of my favorite curmudgeons of all time. Good old okay. Uncle Ez. Okay. Shall I proceed? Please do. Excellent. Dreadic Chores Chorus. Seek ye a staff that was broken. In campus ground it lies, where ne'er a wood mouse did burrow, or dog arf at a bone. Hence gathered pagans, drunken pagans, and Saint Stephen rang his bell. Much howling amongst these woods, and the natives were restless. The wicked eye hung baleful in the night sky. The muttering, murmuring troll searched on in the forest. Glad to meet you, Mojo, Glade Stone, Ram Bam, the holistic battalion of broken bang. Pirates aren't easy to know, and they're harder to drink with. Star guitar, moral gore, for the crabs were evil and they would not learn morals. Amongst the natives, there was little rejoicing for all was amiss and besotted and the way was not clear. 
surely some force put hindrances in our way, or are we the force? Star Wars flashed before the eyes of those in the astounded circle. Circle of light, valley bright. Oh yes, we used to sing that. And a ring and Mabel and me and the baby makes three. Zen overtakes the West and television shifts. Rocket propulsion, we're in outer space. Transcendental psychosis. What? Back down. Learn to see this interchange. Overcharged, no charge. Excellent credit rating. And a skipping tune rambling down that years ago. I don't know what the hell that means, but I like it. <laughs> I think tra transcendental psychosis. Is that like taking a uh, too strong a hit of LSD, or what would that be? Yeah, I think that's better than the other kind of psychosis, right? Transcendental psychosis. I thought I was Jesus Christ. <laughs> but I was wrong. It's just I was just one of many Jesus Christ. Though, okay, <laughs> right. Okay. All that right. Well, thank. Thank Go you. Ahead. Yeah. Thank you, David. That's what Number I'm three. Go on, please. Three is a charm. For the occasion, and I've read this one before, but it's it's uh, timely. Winter solstice poem. Shortest day of the year is in fact here. Rain fuzzy, darkening gray, quilting San Francisco Bay. Christmas shopping crowds in quiet overcoats, filling the roads. Lighted storefronts twinkling in the streets, smells of roasting foods on the breeze. Head on home to bundle in a small Yuletide room with a small and warming drink, a quiet candle flame, and a small pen in a book. Long night gathers on this the northern earth gathers all to semi-hibernatory sleep. Well, nothing hibernatory or sleep about that poem. Thank yeah. you, David. Thank you. All, always a hoot. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, always a hoot. I like that. Semi-hibernatory sleep. <laughs> I could use one of those, actually. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Very nice. Well, I think it's my turn to come up now. And I'd like to mention that uh, I'm going to read uh, three poems related to Christmas. And um, I read one of them last week. But since last week, I've been informed that one of them is being adapted by a jazz improvisational dance company. And they would like me to record it tonight so that they can study it. And another one is to be posted on a, a, a Zoom line. They want to borrow it. So I'm going to read you three, and um, I'll begin with the first one, okay? And um, uh, um, suffer me if you heard it last week, but I did say I would uh, uh, recite it again today for it, so it could be used on another website. And uh, this poem is called Ask, and the history is simply this. There's a period of extreme high unemployment in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and throughout the industrial Midwest and industrial belt. And I was at a wine and cheese party in uh, mid-December, uh, uh, dipping into uh, uh, the wine and cheese. Standing next to me was Becky Newland, a, a, a Catholic school teacher and a believer in, in uh, uh, liberation theology. And uh, Becky said, me and Becky were talking about the glum news and, and uh, you know, unemployment and, and, and the issues that go along with that. And uh, Becky turned around to me at one point and said, Mo, what are we going to do? And it just came out of my uh, uh, heretic mouth. Okay, Becky, I'll ask Santa Claus, you ask God. And so uh, later that evening or, or the next day, I wrote this poem and um, it got circulated um, uh, by these lay Catholic school teachers to their high school students to read 
and they read it and it caused um, uh, a lot of reaction. And the Archbishop of Pittsburgh found out about that and summarily commanded that the, the, that the poem be withdrawn from classrooms and subsequent discussion be squashed. So I knew I had done something right. And so here's what I uh, wrote to um, Becky. Ask, I'll ask Santa Claus and you ask God. Come late December, a blanket of snow needs to fall soft and wet upon the jagged quilt of our land. That a fresh wind may sweep clean old maples and pines to cool our busy heads and tempers that may we may look, listen, and curiosity, innocence, returning babes in ourselves. I'll ask Santa Claus and you ask God to set one star apart brilliant, its shimmer stirring waves of hope, of faith across the nighttime sky for all to claim. To a nighttime drifter who would cradle a fallen sparrow in the cups of his hands, feeding his fellow creature from the milk of his heart, this being purpose, this being meaning. I'll ask Santa Claus, you ask God, to make up small pleasures, some magic, some gifts for an orphan, and multiply this child's visions shaped in his dreams that he and she may lend them generously to every child who seeks the laughter. I'll ask Santa Claus and you ask God, do you think they might turn, listen to the bend of wide maples and tall pines, might blow upon the winds to give direction as the cold night sky soothes the pain of a drifter lost, a sparrow fallen, to brighten the hollow eyes of our needy neighbors. Jesus, seeing the same, routed the money lenders. Turning to the hungry, we shall have our loaves and fishes. Pray you, do these deeds in spirit, in acts. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the Pharisee sent the soldier. For the priests to bury, the intellectuals to heal, for the children to witness. I'll ask Santa Claus, you ask God, we're not asking for much. A fresh white blanket of snow, soft and wet upon the cheeks, a lone star shining, fire in the hearts of men. Peace settles, all is calm. All is bright, waken. That's, uh, that's that one. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, now, uh, here is, um, let me go here. Uh, let me find it. Give me a second. Okay, um, on December 6th, uh, on December 25th, Christmas, 2004, I was sitting at my kitchen table here in Paris with the radio on, and an announcement came over the airwaves that James Brown had died. And so within hours, I wrote this on Christmas Day, 2004, and it's called The Day James Brown Died. The day James Brown died, time stopped, the clock on the wall, the noisy fridge went quiet, songbird turned silent. The day James Brown died, supreme rhythm maker beat out a cadence in straight six time. As the tambourine shaker let a two-step backbone twist and turn double split from the floor back at your man. The day James Brown died, I was black and I was proud. The day James Brown died, the news crossed rivers, 
Oceans made continents groove, rattling chain gangs. Freedom march makers and, I'm sorry, calling black bottom farmers, Georgia sharecroppers, humble day laborers, cleaning lady mothers, freedom march makers, and little children opening books. The day James Brown died, hookers and pimps and hustlers and players took the night off. The day James Brown died, his song rang through the Pythagorean Ethernet sphere of mathematical musical harmony. The day James Brown died, Cab Calloway led a celestial 40-voice gospel choir to please, please me. The day James Brown died, I lowered my head and bowed. Lenny came by and hollered through the window, Hey, man, the Godfather is up and gone. Yeah, babe, Papa got a brand new bag. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well done. Now, you like that, huh? Okay. And uh, James Brown went, the many people had a photo of things to do. And say what what was that now? I said it seems he looked he he sounded like an insignificant person because when he left people did several things after he left. Based on what you formulated. Um, over here there was a whole lot of solemnity among a lot of people, let me tell you. That stopped the clocks for a lot of people. And that's a fact. Okay. Now, this next poem I'm going to read um, was my best friend in life committed suicide Christmas night. And it goes like this, and it's called The Wake. Did you grip the metal and grit your teeth, roll your eyes? Raise the pistol, put down the pain, aim point blank, bullet to the brain. Wait, did you think of me before the squeeze, the sigh of relief, one last laugh as you let it rip? Joe has died, and with him goes a part of me where a brilliant light flickers and fades to Somethingness. My main man's gone, committed suicide. Joe had what so many want, very few possess, was with Joe while Joe was here with us. You see, Joe had that gifted talk, his funky walk, his stride and pride, styled and flair, all his own, that goddamn beautiful Joe. And oh, for the life of me, as cute and bad as I could be, most I could do was shadow dance when that man took the floor. He, the daring, dashing north side prince, and I, the East End Cinderella fella, it was a ball. Often we danced with the ladies, moving in circles, shoulder to shoulder, side to side. We were so loose, cause we were so tight. Caring, sharing, and drinking, and swearing to our friends and our fathers alike. Now look here, folks, Moe and Joey wish to inform you we are taking a pause for the cause. And now you come and tell me my main man's gone, committed suicide. Joe has died. Now hear me cry. I have missed a rare moment, one I repressed leaning into his pal, driving arms against that hammer in his chest. Making our getaway, up we went and over the wall from dead-end streets and deadbeat deeps, the slums and their sums and long-gone dreams choked in a cloud of factory smoke. Gone with him, that gifted talk, that funky walk, I'm canceling Christmas and the 4th of July. My main man's gone, committed 
suicide. Alone with memories, they prance about the room and fall upon me like hot rivets and fly ash, north side, sweaty, salty, blood-stained, steel-toed, wet, drenched. I can still smell him. Here's to Joe, you beautiful son of a bitch. We had plans, man. But you took it on the chin. Who knows? It could have been me. It could have been different. We should have vacationed. Two mates at anchor. A noonday sun. A condor source. The earth stands still. Trouble behind, trouble behind. I'll be the wind and you be the kite. Lovely. Thank you. I'll be the wind and you'll certainly be the kite. Yes. Thank you. That was beautiful. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Mo. Yeah, it still chokes me up as it did yep. back now reading it. Um, I, uh, a postscript to that is, um, I was invited to read it a poetry reading that was peopled by people from uh, the better Northeast schools. And um, uh, they uh, reluctantly let me be the last reader in the reading that night because I had not been published and was not associated with, with Brown or Yale or, or those schools um, coming from you know the East End of Pittsburgh and all. And I read the poem. And as a result, I got sent on a national tour so what are you gonna do you never know right you're gonna step up and read so okay um thank you for listening and we're gonna take a break now and and please uh there was a lot of comments that you folks uh, gave to one another and feel free to repeat those comments as i admit another poem another poet into the room and she lydia smith i think is the name Lydia Cortez. Ah, uh, yes. Lydia. Hello, Lydia Cortez. Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm about to say I'm the only lady for today. Well, you're not now because um, Lydia, Lydia Cortez is here. Welcome, Lydia. Hi, thank you. And where in the world are you in this day? Uh, lower Manhattan. I've, I've heard <laughs> lower of it. Manhattan. On Spring Street. Oh wow! Oh, in the village. My... Are you in the village? Yeah, the way my. Yeah, well, I guess so. It's really little Italy, but they call it all kinds of things yeah, nowadays. Right down... Like they call it uh, Soho. They call it um, Soho. They call it Noho. They call it uh, Nolita. But what it really is is the tail end of Little Italy. Okay. I've been on Spring Street uh, west of uh, 7th Avenue, so I, I thought you were meaning the village, but cool. Yeah, Where? I'm on, um, no, I'm on the east side of the of Spring Street. Right, okay. Uh, like east, east, east of Broadway. Gotcha. Oh, okay, cool. Well, welcome on board, Lydia. And uh, we, just, we just concluded the first round and I'm taking a little break before we, we resume the second round. So you're, you're, you're right on time okay. for that, okay? Okay. okay. Uh, well, what, you're gonna be starting uh -oh. that soon? In a few minutes, yeah. It's our custom to take a break between the rounds and have, okay. a, little, have a little chat with each other and uh, okay. resonate on what's going on or on on previous yeah. works that were read, for that matter. So uh, that's what we yeah. do. Yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, I have to leave at five, unfortunately, for another Zoom meeting. But I'll hang around till then. Well, that's so New York. You're always like loaded up for so many events. So we hope you're around when you get. We hope you're around when we call on you. I'll try to do that. But okay. we don't. Okay, we don't. Thank you. We don't stop the show for busy New Yorkers. Yeah. Uh, if we're, I, worth, I if we're worth it, you'll come in and read. If you're not, you'll go somewhere better. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> or it'll be for another time. Whatever. 
It's good to see you, though. Good to see you. Yeah. How did you hear about us? Thank you very much. How did you hear about us? Um, I just saw I, I just saw you on uh, an advertisement on uh, Facebook. I saw you on Facebook. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was on it. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. And uh, speaking yeah. of which, let's see what. Okay, so it's like what four twenty two for you in New York? Yeah, my 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 phone says four twenty three. <laughs> well, you're, hey, you're ahead of me. Give it that New York Close. minute. Yeah, I guess another New York minute, right? Give it that New York minute. All right. That's right. Well, well we're allowed to come back on before you have to leave. And what we do okay. is start, uh, we start, we get together and talk at 2 p.m. New York time. And then we, we seem okay. to go into the reading itself toward 3 p.m. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what we do. Okay, so good. Okay. So welcome. Sounds good to me. So thank I tell you what, so much. I oh, very yeah. very appreciated. No, don't worry about it. Hey, we're glad to have you on board. We like to hear from new voices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you any related? Even relation? in old bodies. <laughs> are you any? <laughs> don't remind me. Hey, uh, are you any related to Jane Cortez? Unfortunately, no. Um, and I think she spelled her last name with, with a Z. Z. Cortez yeah, right. with a Z. Oh, she yeah. does. You're and right. She... Yeah. She was wonderful. I, I remember seeing her in performance uh, on the Upper West Side at some bar. I forget what the... They had a lot of poetry and music in that bar. She was fantastic. She was wonderful. And probably at... Um, oh, God. What was it called? Um, it, it, it yeah, it's, was, it's on the tip of my tongue too. It, I mean, it was a. Uh, it, it, it was. It had at one point. It had been. At, was it Cleopatra's needle? No, no, no. no. It, it had okay. been. It had been a, a Columbia bar during the up into yeah, the yeah. 80s. Yeah, right, yeah. And that's where Cleopatra went on 106th Street, right? Okay. Right, right, right in that that area. Yes, and I think, uh, Lydia, I now recognize you from, uh, you're a member of Advanced Poetry Workshop. Is that right? On Facebook? Advanced Poetry Workshop? No, unless I'm, I'm not part of that. I'm not a member of that, but, uh, yeah. but I've, I've been around. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I've been around. Okay. All right. Okay, well, we were in the neighborhood, so wouldn't it have been the West, would it have been the West End Club, which I believe is on a hundred. Yes, I think that it was. It was the yeah. West End, and then it yeah, moved into. Yes, yes, right. Yes, that's what that was it. Because, because I, I still go. I drop by. Very good. Very good. Yeah, because I stay right above there at one hundred and fifteen. Yeah. Okay. okay. That was the West End, and. Uh, yeah. It was a wonderful place. It, is it still functioning? Does yes, it is. It? Yes, it is. Yeah. Now well, it's basically still with poetry. And... It's got a different name, though. Well, I okay. I saw it last last January. It's the West End Club, unless really? I was. I thought the yeah. West End was now on 106th. At... Yeah, 106th, and uh, what is it, Eighth Avenue or West? Yeah. No, West End at Avenue. The end of Riverside Drive uh, at the end of West End Avenue. Yeah. Yeah, right. because I walked down past there at night to see what's happening. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, but the the original West End okay. was, was farther up Broadway. It was at 115. Okay, it was there. Right. That that was the famous, uh, you know, when the Kerouac and Ginsburg went to Columbia and mm -hmm. so forth. That's when they they would hang out there. Well, damn, I stay on 115, 115th, and yeah. now I'll know what I missed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. All right, great. great. Is, the, is the Spring Lounge still open? The Spring Lounge is still open, but, um, you know, that's where um, the filmmaker, a lot of filmmakers, but uh, the one with the big white hair, and I'm right, blanking right. out on his name, he used to he used to hang out there. Um, yes. Um, it's still open. Actually, it's still the 
customers there are diehard because there's a couple of little outdoor places because it has to be outdoor now. Um, and people are, and they're not heated and they're flimsy little wood still there drinking even the day of the snowstorm even on these subsequent days yeah. you see people huddled in there drinking yeah. it's amazing why not why not yeah and by why the way not? yeah and the shark the shark is still in the bar okay and, and by the way the uh i go by the west end club and it's now become a very popular hangout for lgbt and they do a lot. They do a lot of celebrations there, where everybody gets dressed up to oh, the great. max. Oh, yeah. must be a lot of fun. So L L G B T and no Q. Well, whatever. I mean, uh, the, uh, the whole bit. <laughs> okay, it's mostly transvestites. <laughs> it's it's mostly transvestites who like. It must be a lot of fun. Oh, it is. I honey, I hang out with them people, and they don't ask me for my uh, gender uh, identification. I just hang out and love them. You know, we take or pictures. <laughs> yeah, they don't ask me what what. Uh, I think so. I like the gender 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 qualifications is better. Yeah, yeah. They just have a good time <laughs> without you. You don't have to be PC or I know. Outside. You just show yeah, up. Yeah, I it, think that's wonderful. And it, it, it's you know, liberating. Me and this other straight, this girl was there, and she was hot, and I was curious. And all the other girls were dressed up so well, and we just had such a good time. That's great. Yeah, so. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, that's just a friendly bunch. And it stays open very, very, yep. very late, which I like. Hey, anybody else have anything to say from that first but round? But now they can't have it. Yeah, does anybody else have anything to say about that first round? Uh, I. I Saw a lot of um, uh, a lot of chats on the chat box there. Uh, hey, hey, Jack, do you have are, are you of the opinion that I don't like Christmas? Uh, no, Bill. I'm of the opinion you don't like much. <laughs> That's why we call him the judge. And uh, uh, so, how many things are there to like? Huh? <laughs> That, that's my secret. You could count them on Django Reinhardt's <laughs> left hand. <laughs> Got that right. Now, Marion uh, had to leave, and he said thank you for including him. And as I mentioned earlier, Nina Zavencevic, uh, our lady from, uh, from Serbia, New York, and, and Paris, uh, while she was on prior to the first round, she got a call that someone in her family had died. And I believe fortunate. she called me earlier today and told me that her older sister was in grave condition. Oof. So I'm gonna assume that uh, she, talking about her older sister. So yeah, 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 yeah. So there you go on that one. Does anybody else have anything to chime in about before we start the uh, second round? Um, I don't know. Um, I like Christmas. 